Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are in Europe. Um, welcome to this fourth webinar in our series on methodologies and good practices for process automation project with Bonita. As I said, it's the fourth one. So just in case one of you um, had to leave before the end of the webinar, I just want to remind you that the whole series is available on video on YouTube. So today we are going to finish the development phase and prepare the deployment in production. Therefore, I am pleased today to present this webinar with Victor, who you can see, and who will share with you his experience in the development of the user interface with the UI designer. Victor, maybe you can present, introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Delphine. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Victor Garcia. I was a Bonita Soft Consultant for five years now, and now I'm the training manager. And today I'm going to show you the best practices using the UI design. So let's start. Yes, thank you, Victor. Um, all you are going to see here uh, is based on the design of our product, on the experience of our consultant, like Victor, but also on a large number of comments from our users and customers who were kind enough to share with us their way of working and all their comments. Let's start and just a quick reminder uh, of where we are now. Um, as you know, and if you have followed our um, series, the project life cycle and the continuous improvement life cycle uh, is done in five main phases. We have already talked about the three first phases, which are the discovery and design, where we are going to define the strategy, define the personals that are involved, make sure that we identify uh, what we want to do and the success we want to uh, reach. Then we talked about the project methodology to launch the implementation, and we talked about the methodology we think is the best one here, which is iterative, and talking about the smallest possible value, and defining a happy process path to make sure that you will reach the implementation, and then iterating to add values as, you, as, of, um, as the goal. And as part of the development, we started with the way to work and collaborate between technical team and what we call citizen developers, which can be users, business, um, business stakeholders, uh, during the development of the process, the contracts, and so on, um, which uh, which is done mainly in the studio. So now we are going to see how to finish this development phase of the Bonnet application with the UI designer, and also to prepare the deployment in production. That's why we are going to see how to install and configure a suitable platform. But let's start with the development and good practices about development with the UI designer of Bonita. This part of the presentation will allow you to discover three explanations done by me and a demonstration led by Victor, good practices to optimize your developments with the UI designer. Just a reminder, and just before you start, you have to think about the way you are going to work and develop your, um, your user interface. So where do you want to start from? You have two ways to take the project. Either you want to start with the development the web development of the application and start with the user interface. That's something lots of developers like to do because that's their way to approach a project. And sometimes for a developer, it's not necessarily obvious to start with the process part. That's why that's something you can do and you can start in the UI designer. The only thing is that you are going to define the variables, the contract and the process and the data from the uh, business data model manually. The second way to do it is to follow the proposed methodology we have already seen in the last chapters, 
because you are going to start with the process, then define the data, define the contract that will lead um, the way your process, your data, and your user interface are connected. And this will allow you to benefit from something that is uh, really quick in Bonita and really valuable, which is the forms auto-generation. In any case, what we suggest is that you iterate with the smallest value possible while building the application and that you collaborate with business users. Victor is going to show you how you can do that very easily. If we want to start, and especially for those who don't really know um, Bonita Living Application, let me show you in, well, three concepts what it is. It is a user application that is based on processes. So as you can see at the right side of the slide, the Bonita Living App are based on a multi-layer architecture with the processes, the data, and the user interface. That's why we say it's structured as well, but also customizable. You can take any part of your pages, your forms, your widgets, uh, your extensions and so on, and customize anything. Also, it can be very easily updated in production without being obliged to release a new version of your application. Why? Because we have a concept that is called living application. Oh, sorry, live, living, live updates of your living application. <laughs> the live updates will um, allow you to update in production parameters, widgets, fragments, um, and, may, uh, and I think that's all. Maybe you tell me, Victor, if I forget something. <laughs> so that's it with the Bonita Living App. How it is connected? because as I said, it is structured. So your application will be based on an application descriptor. On community, this descriptor is an XML file. In subscription edition, it will be based on a wizard. This application descriptor is linked directly to pages, to the layout and the theme that can be customized, and to profile. The profiles uh, in community are restricted to the user uh, and admin profiles, but in subscription, for example, you can define custom profiles that can have different roles. Then it is linked through the process definition to the forms and the process configuration, which means that you are going to link your page to your process through the form, for example, and you can define the pages to be um, to, to support your process path. And more than that, you can use extensibility and custom customizations through the custom widgets, the way you are going to define your business data model, the organization that you are going to define and that will be taught, uh, directly linked to your profiles and your application. And if you need to extend it, you can use the rest of your extensions. Okay, that's good, but how? what is our approach? So the approach is really a low-code approach to speed up the development. Here is the vision of our CEO, Miguel Valdez. He thinks that low-code will not, will not enable specific groups, such as on one side citizen developers or on the other side professional developers, but that low-code approach will help mixed teams with different profiles to collaborate better without restrictions, which means that they are going to understand each other. And that's true, a good mix between graphic tools and code. That's why we believe that this approach and the UI designer are made for citizen developers and above all, the IT team developers, because they are going to work with it. So we have to make sure that it's easy for them and that we will accelerate their development phase. Thanks to what? To the technologies. We use Bootstrap 
which is a WYSIWYG page structure with columns, CSS classes, and we use AngularJS 1.3. Before you ask, because I know that AngularJS 1.3 is not supported anymore, um, why we remain on this technology for the time being is that because when we create a page with the UI designer, we create a page template, which is not directly linked to your AngularJS. We just used this framework and we based we are based on this framework, but the UI designer is specific, which means that in production, it could be exported with a different framework. For example, you could imagine that you want to export it in HTML5 or even use it as a web component. Then, how are you going to accelerate your development is thanks to a connection between the UI designer and the other components and for example through the forms auto generation that Victor is going to show just before just after and finally and that's really where the demo will be interesting we have features that are going to accelerate the development during the de the development itself of the user interface and now I think I will let Victor show everything because a graphic is even better than thousand words. So let me know when my screen is shared. We can see it. Okay, so let's go to the point. Um, here we have a process that is a simple process apparently that is called customer management. So the idea here is to provide the input of a new customer and in this human task uh, just do the review of the data that were introdu uh, introduced uh, in the first uh, place, in the instantiation form. And after, let's see if we can add several tasks in order to show you different things. So, we have this tiny process. Let's take a look on the database, on the uh, BDM, business data model. So, here we are, the customer I create. This is a, an object. A business object with uh, different attributes. As you can see, they they are strings and an active boolean. In order to to say if this customer is going to be active or not. Okay. So I have a variable related to this uh, business object, and also I have the contract. So I'm going to ask to the view to retrieve this information. So the view. It's going to send me this information and after that I'm going to use the script, as you already know, to do the mapping into the business data model, okay, our BDM. Okay, I'm doing that at the beginning of the process and I'm doing exactly the same for the customer review in this human task, okay, but in both cases we don't have a form attached to it, okay, we don't have the mapping of the form. So what happens if I run this process? So I'm running, I'm deploying this process. You can see it here. Well, it says that I need to configure the actor. It's going to be quickly. So I select, for example, everybody on the organization. So everybody can start this process. And I have here another uh, interface where I can see this kind of form. Okay, this is a a form auto-generated in the way of uh, this is like a template because I didn't define a form but it takes the information from the country. Okay. So the idea of the low-code approach is that when I click on a button I automatically generate uh, a form based on the contract but using the technology we may mentioned before, we include Bootstrap, we include, uh, include AngularJS, and we can personalize a little bit our form. So that's the idea. So first, if we take a look before on the editor, our page and forms editor called UI Designer. We access to it uh, through this button. So here we are, the home page. Uh, this is a um, web application deployed on the Tomcat server that is running behind the studio. Okay, when we launch the studio, the Bonita Studio, we have a Tomcat server behind. 
So this is the one of the web applications deployed. The other one is going to be the, the port, okay, but in the port. So what can we see here? We can see the different artifacts that we can create. As you can see them here, like application pages, like layouts uh, for our application, and process forms. Okay, maybe a good idea is, as uh, David mentioned before, not to start using the form here, because we are going to be forced to build all the links to retrieve information to the database, etc., create all the variables. So a better idea will be to directly let Bonita how to generate the form for me based on my needs, which are the contract. Um, among, among those, we have the custom widgets creation as well and the fragments. So I'm going to show you quickly what is this about, but later. If we take an example of a page, for example, we can see the page editor, which is going to be exactly the same as the form editor or the um, layout editor. Okay, so we have a bunch of uh, widgets that we can drag and drop here. Every single widget that we select contains its properties here on the right side. And we have different types of properties. Basically, the, those are the AngularJS properties. Okay. At the bottom, we have different variables. We can create a set of variables. And this is not the purpose of this webinar to define and uh, to explain all the types of variables, but you can have an idea. And also, we can have the assets. So we can include different assets like CSS, JavaScript, images, or a localization file. <coughs> In a <that> way, <coughs> sorry, uh, externally or locally. My personal recommendation is to in case you, you can, just to download the library, in, in this case uh, I'm assuming JavaScript, usually we can use the CTN, right, to call through the URL to that artifact or that asset. So the idea is to do it locally. So in the production server, you assure that this is going to work. Sometimes the production server is going to be uh, with no internet access. So in that case, it's not uh, going to work. So this is my personal recommendation, okay? Always to do a, a local uh, implementation of the assets. So by default, we have two inter uh, interesting assets, like the style CSS. So for example, directly included in the product, we have the style CSS, and it's ready to be used. So here we can say margin top 25 and we can create our margin top 25 pixels for example and this is going to be ready to use this class is going to be ready to use okay or we can import our own as well we have the localization.json file this file is useful when we need to translate our product so our development uh, in fact we can see that we have based on the language that the, the end user uh, choose. So, for example, France from fonts. And we take the key in English, case list, and we have the proper translation. Those are a couple of examples by default, like uh, Spanish from Spain, or Japanese from Japan, or Portuguese from Portugal, or no, uh, this time is from Brazil. Okay. And you can add several languages here, Italian, German, etc. Okay, you just need to add. So as for an example, um, if we click on the preview, we can take a look on this page. And we can see that the default language is English. And if we change it, we can do directly the translation. Okay. So this is uh, about the translation, the localization file. Okay, so this is a quick uh, review of the UI designer. There are many, many things. So, for example, this is the bootstrap approach. We can develop once the same page or form and decide um, what is going to be the pre-visualization in the different uh, devices. So, a small device, a tablet, a laptop, 
a big screen. And also we can change the name, give some information, export, etc. So I think it's going to be better to do an example with the case, with the use case we have. So let's create our form directly from the instantiation contract, which is this one. We don't have a form attached to it, but when I click on this button, as you can see, I have a new form. So first thing I do always, because the studio is going to take always the new form uh, label. This is going to be a new customer. So a new customer, I click on save, and if I go back to the studio, you can verify that this is mapped. Okay, UI designer and the studio. Um, you see here the different widgets used according to the contract information or contract type. So this one is Boolean, for example, so we can see this is a checkbox. Okay. Sometimes we need to change the so why not replace this information with another widget. So here we can change this information from one widget to the other. Okay, the only thing we need to do is to configure the properties from one side to the other side. And it's done. Sometimes we don't have the widget we need. So we need to create a custom widget. But usually we can start from a known widget, like this input widget, for example, that is provided with the tool. So if I want to extend the information of this widget, I could first take a look on how it's done. And here you are, the widget editor page. So in this UI uh, Designer page, we can see the template as the HTML. So this is the part of the HTML, the template. We have the controller, which is related with the JavaScript. Okay? But I don't, I, I can modify anything. I mean, this is an input widget, the one provided by by default, so I cannot touch anything. In fact, we have here the properties, so the ones we are using to uh, define the behavior of the widget, but I cannot touch that. But what I can do is to save as my input, and from that moment, this is mine. So I can recover the code, and I can implement a new code, Okay, add something there, and automatically it's going to be done. Okay, and the same with the properties. In fact, I can retrieve all the properties I can define here, the different types of properties, and I can retrieve them directly using the dollar scope dot properties dot require or is bound, which is going to be over there. Okay. In addition, we can create for a custom widget, we can add some assets as before, but these are going to be related with the context of the custom widget. So I can add a library or a module, an Angular module that I find, I found uh, through internet. So I can mention the module here, and directly I could use it in the control. Okay, so this is just an example of how we can create a custom widget. Um, so in my customer that is being created, now I could say the project and this time run the process with my new customer and I can create a customer. So let's first take a look on the database. Okay, this is a client for the H2 database. So I can see all the business objects. As you can see, this is empty. So I'm going to create my name, for example, Victor, Pia, Company, Microsoft, and email, Victor, at bonita.com. Uh, I'm going to activate this new customer. So now the process started. I have a new instance of the process, and I have a new task. The task is customer review. So the customer review is uh, related with this task. I can take a look on the database and I can check that everything is on the database now. So we can repeat the same operation but for this human task. So from the contract, again, 
they have the operations, of course, but I don't have the form. So I'm going to create the form through the button. I'm going to give it a name, like for example, customer review. Okay, it's going to be printed with the task with the same name. And now I have, maybe I didn't save it properly. Well, it should be, maybe it's, it's not been refreshed. Hold on. Yeah, it's there. It was the refreshing of the, the studio. So now I have the uh, form. So in this form, it's a little bit different from the, the auto creation of the first one, because this is not an instantiation form. And in this case, what, what, what is interesting is to recover the information from the database, right? I want to show the information of my customer, or I want to review. So in this case, I want to uh, check if everything is right, or if I made a mistake, I can modify the information. So if we take a look on the variables, there is one variable that has been used in several variables, so it has a dependence on the others, task ID, which is a URL parameter ID. So I'm taking the identifier of the task from the parameter uh, in the URL, and I'm using that to retrieve the context and to retrieve the customer. And all the customers, or their customer variable, is being used in the widgets. So the idea is, if I click on preview, I don't see anything, right? And the, the thing that I like to develop with is with the real information, the information of my case, right? So here is the tip. We can click on this button, so we are no longer in the preview mode. Well, we are in the preview, but not in the same context. And here we can modify the URL, and we can pass the parameter that we are missing. So this is the task ID 2 for the case 1. So if I pass the identifier 2 and I reload the page, here we are the information from the database, which is exactly the same I have here. right? So from that moment, they can work with the real information of my case while I'm developing this task or this form. In addition, we can take a look using the console. I take a look on the network side and I reload the form. We can see that the first call was using the API, okay, giving the information of this task identified by two. Um, that's why I can print the customer review, right? Because the information I get from the from the engine through the API is, for example, display name, and I can display the customer review or the description or whatever. The second thing I do with the task ID is to retrieve the context. So this call is using this call using the task ID to retrieve the context. So the context of this case. And in the context, we are going to see the business variables and the document variables related to the case. This time is the customer, the business variable. So customer underscore ref dot link can give me the information of the same register I have in the database. In fact, if I copy paste, this is a get call, right? So I can retrieve the same information. And this is the same information. So this is my persistence ID 1, this is my persistence ID 1, so it's the same information. Check this out, because I, I see the information properly. You see, the structure is properly. This is why I'm using this, um, this extension, this add-on, JSON Viewer. So the idea is to use the same information here. How can we do that? So I can add a text here at the bottom, and my idea is to print the context, right? Or the context for the customer, which finally is the information that I want to display to the widgets. So I say customer, colon. I can access to the variables I define here through the double curly brackets because this is some interpolation, it's a kind of it's a type of uh, property, it's a property type. So if I do customer like that, we are able to check 
the information of the customer. And in fact, this is true, but uh, this is not properly undented, right? The, this is the undention of the of the object is not well. So I like to see the structure exactly like that. How can we do that? Well, we are using Angular JS, right? So I can use the filters like this one, pipeline JSON, to filter by JSON. And this is going to be a little bit better okay, with the spaces, etc. But it's not enough. So here is the recommendation. As we can use HTML, we can grab everything through a pre uh, tag, HTML tag, and now we have information properly. So we can assure that the customer contains the right information. We did the, the call to the API uh, perfect, and we can use it to customer.name display the information as it is here through the double binding file here in the valley. This is not for this demo, but let me show you something new in the 7.10. Here we have one part that is called data model. As you can see, I have the two objects that I have in my business data model. If I want to create a variable directly to get the information of this object, I can drag and drop the variable. I can give it a name, customer1, why not? And I can access to the information, like, for example, give me 10 elements, 10 registers of, or 10 customers from the page zero, okay, and we can use pagination. Or we can search or find by company where the company, it was when it served, for example. So if I say, this is gonna create a variable business data, data type. Okay, this is just an example. This is not in this webinar. This is going to be explained a little bit uh, more in future webinars. Okay, I think the last thing I want to show you guys is the fact of uh, creating fragments. So let me go back for a moment. Imagine for this simple use case, we want to retrieve the information of a new customer. So the name, surname, company, the email, and if the user is going to be, or the customer is going to be active or not. Okay, and we are going to use that information to print and let the user to do the re the review. But maybe we can add several tasks up to I don't know eight, and we want to use always the same information, but in read only this time. So what we can do is to convert this into a fragment. So a fragment is a kind of group of widgets that can be really useful when we are developing. The development because that's a for example. Because it's going to be treated as a simple widget. So here we are, a new fragment, customer info, and as you can see, it's like a widget. So let's configure the custom uh, fragment. Here is the fragment editor, which is kind of the same as before, with the difference that we can create a variable that is going to be exposed to the page or form or layout that are going to use this fragment. So I'm going to use a variable, data external, external data, in fact, and I'm going to replace the form input customer input name for this one, date, text. Here, 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 and the last one, here. And in fact, for the demo I want to do, I'm going to create another one, like read-only. I want to show this information read-only, yes or not. So depending on the information that is going to be uh, filled outside the fragment, I can use this variable, read-only. And sometimes I will let the user to see the information in read only, and other times it's going to be uh, to to complete the information or to modify the information. 
So in the new customer, if I go back to the first form, we can see that we have two different properties. So data X that we were using for the first uh, form, like form input dot customer input, and then inside the fragment dot name dot surname, etc. I read only this time is going to be false, right? Because I want to let the user to complete the information. Okay. And in the second form, instead of having all of that, imagine that I have to create another one and another task. This is going to be easier, right? I just take this, and this time I say that this is my customer. I read only uh, true, because this time, imagine, in, in the use case I'm, I'm imagining, uh, I just want to provide information in read. So, Let's take a look if this is working as expected. I'm going to create the theme. I'm going to activate, send. <clears throat> I can check the, the database. So you can see that I have a second register with uh, Delphine, my second customer. And now this time, I have the information of this guy. Well, I forgot to remove the, the other information, you see. But for the fragment, we can see that everything is in there and in read -on. So that's all for now, guys. Uh, thank you. Just to precise that this last um, feature that Victor presented, um, is the fragments is a feature you can find in the uh, edition enterprise otherwise all the other features are available on community just to sum up and give the best practices in a nutshell uh, beside all uh, the tips that victor gave you in this presentation you need to decide your starting point which is uh, important if you want to start with the application you can or the process you can then don't forget to collaborate with the business users and especially as uh, Victor showed you, um, you can use the, the ability of the preview and uh, the tip of the task ID, for example, to make sure that you can show them easily in the application itself with the right, uh, the profiles, um, how it will look like. Then we encourage you to use the industrialization, extensibility, and reusability capabilities that Victor show you, such as the switch widget, the templates, the REST API extensions that you are going to uh, see, for example, in the, by looking at the documentation or in the next um, short webinar we are going to organize, and the reusability, such as with fragments. But the most important is iterate, iterate, and iterate. And now we know that we are at the end of our first iteration and we are ready to go to production. But if you want to get a stable and agile platform, you have to make sure you will prepare the production environment. And why is it so important to anticipate? Because it is difficult to prevent the future so, for example, you can decide to start with a basic server because you have a basic process with the first iteration of your application in production. It's relatively low volume. You don't have those um, uh, high peaks of volume, for example. However, and that's why I wrote that it's only the launch of a digital transformation project, you will have other iterations. You will have more volume and processes to come with need to be maintained, need to performance stability and scalability to make sure you will give the right service to the end users. That's why you have to think about it in advance. And how? You have to respect four best practices. The first one is anticipate. And to do that, the best thing is to have a pre-production environment equal to production. Because then you can make sure you are in a real, real kind of environment. Then you have to think medium, long term. 
as I said, you can start with basic server because it's it's sufficient. But the volume will grow, the processes might grow. Um, you might have different ways to to sorry to architecture your platform, and you want to make sure you will maximize and optimize the cost as well. So you have to make sure you will have flexibility. And this flexibility gets through two things. The first thing is to take advantage of the extension capability of the platform with the connectors and the REST API extensions to make sure that you can connect your platform to what is already existing and be efficient. But more important, you have to make sure that your platform is scale scalable. It's very important. Why? Because you are going to be obliged to anticipate the changes, changes in the platform load, depending on new users that can have new needs, uh, changing the organization. For example, if a new company is buying yours, new uh, new organization activity peaks. For example, uh, one of our work customer is having uh, is um, return tax and they have two pixels uh, during the year uh, with millions of, of instances at the same time. So to do so, the scalability will go through two ways. The first one is a vertical scalability by increasing the hardware performance of your machine where the service is running, for example, with new CPUs, with the better RAM, Horizontal, if you want, you can add nodes to your existing service with the same hardware. You can add a cluster of nodes. Uh, and another way to do so is to put your architecture in the cloud because what you are going to configure can be done on-premise or in a private cloud on AWS or Azure or even in Bonita Cloud. You will then use components such as Docker, for example, Bonita provides two official uh, Docker image, one for the community and one for the uh, subscription edition, or Kubernetes, for example, to make it easier to get flexibility. Last best practice is related to the database performance. It is very important. First of all, don't use H2 database that is embedded with the studio. It is not. Uh, production database. Then you have to make sure you have a good database server, a powerful network. Sometimes we don't think about it, but it's important. Don't make sure you don't have lat latency and use a suitable database. Therefore, the documentation must be consulted for that. The recommended stack by Bonitasoft includes, for example, PostgreSQL, SQL, but you can use as well MS SQL, Oracle, different types of database like that. Recently, I asked our support to tell us about the 10 um, common errors that are, not, that are done in production, that are uh, seen in production. And I wanted to share that with you um, because I think it's really important to know that before you go to production. So the first one is the TVM heap size that is not big enough. What is the consequence? The consequence is that your server can be crashing with that out of memory error that you can see overall slowness or you have a high CPU consumption. The, sorry, the second one is linked to the disk space. If you don't have enough disk space, your server will be slow and it will be crash with a disk full error. If you run your server on the embedded H2 database, which is totally not recommended, it won't be scalable. If your server is unable to perform database transaction, then the server will start failing and the process execution as well. You can see also a short X8 transaction timeout. You know that our engine is based on X8 transactions. So the server will not be able to start, nor the connectors 
nor the task executions. Nothing will start. Everything will be failing. Then another error that we see often is that you don't have enough connector and worker threads. This will um, cause slowness on the process execution. Just as a reminder, since 7.9, connectors and worker threads are totally um, unsynchronous. Then sometimes you have not enough database connections. Then for that, the process execution will be failing as well as you will see portal slowness because the process time here events won't be triggered. If you have not enough five descriptors, the process instantiation will be failing and no forms, no page will be loaded. So nothing will be executed. The short session timeout will re will um, resume in the the users being logged out. And finally, um, the max file upload size is not big enough. You won't be able to upload large document or files through the pages and forms. Everything you have seen here as an explanation in the documentation or tips in blogs that are available in our community website. And in order to make it easier for you to identify those errors, we are going to produce a specific document related to that. For the time being, you are ready to deploy. All the deployment phase in the installation production is also documented in the, in the official documentation. If you have questions, of course, we are going to listen to them now. So, is Bonitasoft um, support di distributed installation in the University for Education? We have a specific university program, so we help universities um, installing Bonita. So we work with Bonita community because you can do project, real projects with Bonita communities and we'll help the, the teachers to, well, to do their courses. We give resources. I don't know if it answers your question, Mudu. Oh, someone is asking in two words how it is possible to do a REST API extension. So a REST API extension is a feature that we include where uh, you can basically define first um, the inputs and after you're going to create a Java class, a Groovy class in fact, for the explanation. So I'm going to answer this question and after I'm going to answer the question of the timer to start the process, all right? So basically, yeah. quickly, I can create a new REST API extension. So here I'm going to provide the right inputs, as I said, like the name of the extension you're going to call after. If I'm using the VT and dependencies or not, I can add a permission because the REST API extension, uh, sorry, the REST APIs in general, they are secure. So we can create an extension of an API and we can secure it as well. And we can uh, secure, uh, uh, add the different inputs, input parameters. So we can create and then Maven is going to create that project for us. This is going to be a Groovy project with the Bonita dependencies on the Maven repository. Okay, so to download them. And basically we have a structure that is common for all the resources that we can uh, deploy as artifacts in the resources part of the portal. The basic explanation is that we have a main class, Groovy class, that implements REST API controller. And in the main method, which is the do handle, we pass the request, the response builder, and the context. So simple. We retrieve the input parameters. We can execute the logic here. We can access to the API. We can access to the PDM as well. We can prepare the result, and we can build the response with the result. Usually, we are going to parse the result into a JSON. And basically, that's all in two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so answer, answering the other question, how to start a process automatically every Friday at 5, for example, to connect to an email or to do a report using a PDM information so we can take a document 
out the business information and send the report via email to all the candidates, for example. So here, first, we need to change the event, the starting event, or a timer starting event. We give it a name. So every uh, Friday at 5 or 17. And we add the timer condition. So this is fixed on three different approaches, the duration, the fixed date. Uh, long story short, this is a cycle, so we can select that all the Fridays at, uh, it's at five, okay, so at five. And the most important, we can generate the current expression because this is based on current. So we can do several things. In fact, this is, we can access to the script editor here. Um, this is the value we are going to use, but we can build our own value or we can use even a parameter to modify this value. Okay? And basically, when we deploy this, I can refresh the validation status. So every Friday at uh, 5 p.m., the, a new instance of this process is going to be uh, launched. So let me know if, if I answer your question. But this is how to do it. Yes, I think it's correct. Following question about that. Um, the second question about the same topic is uh, if it is using the server time zone. So, for example, if yeah. you define your process in a certain time zone, uh, you have to be careful because if, for example, another mm. user is on another time zone, it won't have the same time. You're talking about this process starting on yes. five? Okay. Yes. In that and, case, uh, it's going to be on the production server that is going to use the Bonita engine to do the action every Friday at 5, but in the in the server, of course. In the server time zone. Uh, we talked about on the community uh, recently. Uh, sometimes you can be surprised because the, um, the if the time zone defined on the computer in the browser is different from the server time zone, um, you can have, you can see differences. Yeah, this time it's related to the process, so it's the back, uh, it's the, the back end. So it's going to be the back end taking the action of the server time. In fact, if you want to deal with uh, this, uh, with different time zones, etc., like uh, today, for example, that uh, it's five here, but in different time zones, uh, in the Pacific time zone, it was changed recently. So instead of using that uh, hard code, the information of the every Friday at 5, uh, maybe you can use another approach like a parameter. So in that case you can modify the parameter or you can access to a public REST API which is going to provide information uh, or use a custom library to do the same uh, via Java API to retrieve the information about the when is the specific time zone and take into account all that information. So in that case, it's going to be at 5 or it's going to be at 6, depending on the time zone. Mm. But basically, this is yeah. the explanation regarding the process. Thank you, everybody. I wanted to introduce you with the last webinar in English, which will be uh, about what you can do after you deployed your first project. So I hope you will attend, um, because it will be very interesting, because we are going to talk about it uh, from the technical side on the platform monitoring and the process optimization side. So thank you all and uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys.